We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time of conversation. Help us to light up King David, understand you better. Be closer to you, walk with you more deep closely day by day. We give trust this conversation to the hands of our mother as we sing. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Just a quick note before we get on to King David. So I was reading a, another commentator um, today on King Saul, and their interpretation of the evil spirit of the Lord was they believed it wasn't a it was a pressure. And they were, they, what they said was, uh, their opinion, uh, basically it was Saul recognized he'd been rejected by God. That he, he had lost God's favor, he had lost God's grace. Because of that, this he began to be melancholy, um, which led to envy. Anger and mentioned suicide. Okay, too, um, but th that was their interpretation of the story. So um, that was a good thought, uh, good interpretation. Looking at me, at me in a strange look. The question or? No, I just didn't quite understand. David? They said David? Saul. Oh, Saul. Okay. So Saul. Yeah. David's life can be basically. Broke up into three periods. We cover the first period today, and next week, I'll cut to the last two, which means I'll probably cut it to the next three, <laughs> three basic periods of David's life are his early years up until his kingship of Hebron, the death of King Saul. Um, early years, basically the anointing as a young boy after Saul rejected. And you have his kingship in Hebron to his sin with Bathsheba. And you have his from the period of his sin to his death. And this is also the period where he begins to make plans for the temple and repentance. So basically the periods from up until we'll try to cover this first one today. So for Jacob, just because Jacob will ask, the name Saul means an answer, and the name David means beloved. Um, so Saul is an answer because he is the first king chosen, the one picked by God. Prayer, David is the beloved of God. David also becomes synonymous with kingship, with being a king. If you look in the Gospel of Matthew, the first good Matthew begins with the genealogy, or he puts in David, and Matthew and the Jewish writers at the time of Christ see David as uh, the name of David being um, entwined with the kingship. So in the Jewish numerology, David, the name David equals the number 14, which becomes synonymous with kingdom, or kingship. And for, but when they get to the number 14 is by, David is, is made out of three Hebrew letters. Um, Dalit, which is the fourth letter. Oops, that's the wrong, spelled that wrong, excuse me. Oh, John. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> no, I was going to say something. <laughs> Thank you for being patient. <laughs> We've all been to Hebrew school. <laughs> the vow or vav, it's the sixth letter. Then again, the dollar is the fourth letter. Which equals 14. <laughs> and so 14, that, this is why Matthew talks about 14 generations between the different, the different periods, four generations, four generations, four generations. Well, the, the genealogy of Matthew at the beginning. Okay, let's, let's take a look at that, just briefly. Matthew chapter one, 
Just so you guys have a little fun talking about it. Uh, you can see how closely uh, kingship and David become one. So it's Matthew 1, number 17. He goes to the genealogy of um, Abraham and the Christ. So Matthew 1, 17. Thus, the throne generations from Abraham to David is 14 generations. From David, that an exile, 14 generations. An exile, the Messiah, 14 generations. And why did he carry four generations? Because. 14 is the day's number of king. Because he's emphasizing Messiah's kingship. So it's really important again to the Jewish people. So David's name comes synonymous with king and kingship. David, of course, is a shepherd. Psalm 23 is an echo of this, where he says, The Lord is my shepherd. Um, look at before, the, look at the past in the discussion, how there is this great shepherd theme, and many of the figures in the, in the biblical uh, line of Christ are shepherds. Many of them. Many of the great prophets, many of the great kings, many of the start of shepherds. The same thing happened with David. So when Saul becomes rejected because of his arrogance and sin, he refuses to listen to God, he, he builds the mind for himself, he um, tries to keep the best for himself. Rejected. David uh, is not anointed by, by Samuel, and then um, last time Saul gets into this melancholy and depression, it begins to play. A little while later, the famous story of David and Goliath, which is where kind of David enters the scene in a more renowned way. So, according to Jewish legends, which you just it's seen in the legends. It's not so take this with much as you want to. Goliath is also related to David. Uh, according to legend, uh, Goliath is it's right. Um, so in the book of Ruth, Naomi had two daughters in law, uh, uh, Ruth and Opa. The other daughter in law didn't stay with her, the Moabite. And this is the great grandmother of Goliath. According to a Jewish uh, legend, that and, and when she left her, went, ran away from, from Israel, she end, ends up being the grandmother of the line. But this is this is this is this is a pious tradition uh, that's probably on par with the tradition that that Christopher was a dog-headed man. Um, no one responded to that by the Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> but so the Philistines get the Philistines are one of these these continuing threats in the reign of King Saul and other one of the reigns. The Philistines live on the coast of Israel, Mediterranean, um, kind of the north uh, west up upper side. Um, on the edge uh, of the Mediterranean Sea, some places they're called the Sea Peoples of North Africa. Um, and they have a lot of powerful kings, a lot of powerful kings, very powerful. Um, and they become down and threatened in the reign of the kings. And they gather a huge force, and they go out and they approach the kingdom. And among them is this champ. The name of Goliath. He is from a place called Gath. He is Goliath of Gath. And he is described as being a set of giants. And he goes out and then he challenges for 40 days. He goes out and he challenges uh, the king of Israel. 
Does this come to me instead of combat? Why do they bother spilling blood? If your champion defeats me, well, your slave is going to be your champion, they'll be my slave. So we'll, we'll all we'll be served us instead. And for 40 days, he answered this challenge morning and evening, and there's no response. Um, now, who is Goliath? What is this about? First question is how tall is he? And the problem is, is that there's a different that the human magnitude we have is two different numbers we're given. The sum numbers say one, sum so numbers say one, sum so numbers say that other. Um, and so it depends on who you ask. So some manuscripts say six cubits. How tall is a cubit? You don't know. <laughs> and a span. And some say four cubits in a span. What's that in rods? <laughs> It's about three and a half times. No. <laughs> we will look this in a minute. We can do hands, though. I know hands. <laughs> <laughs> Horses. Yeah. So, so ancient Jewish measurement was based upon the body. Um, and so a, a cubit was about eight inches. Uh, where, where it's difficult is, is that there's two different sized cubits. This is down to the weights. Talk with, about Elias's weight of his arm. You see, oftentimes there were different weight from different periods. Mm -hmm. And so there's some of the fudging with it because it wasn't a standardized measurement of weight. Exactly. But as best as I can figure out, um, so a, a cubit was the length from a man's shoulder to his arm. Let's see those things. Um, about a yard. But it ended up being the elbow so it is different times, different places. So work with the elbow to here, eight inches. So it seems to be about eighteen inches would be a cubit, and a span would be about half a distance or about nine inches. If Goliath was six cubits, as some manuscripts say, that would leave him about ten feet tall, or nine and a bit. Irregular, but I'm pretty sure there's earlier accounts of gigantism. There are. Um, no, it's just, it's, it, there are the tallest recorded man in history was Robert Ludlow, who was about nine feet tall. The problem with Gigantus is that we'll look at it. Uh, if it's four cubits in the span, we would be about seven feet tall. Um, or it's, if any of you know uh, Joe Target, um, about as tall as Robert. Joe, Joe, Joe is six foot eight, I believe. It's a tall guy. So I think like Joe Target, but. Um, a lot of muscular and training here. And, and there is <clears throat> evidence on both sides is the problem. The evidence for this is that this is the traditional understanding. This is the uh, common understanding. This is the common, the church fathers would think of this as the right one. This is what the Jewish tradition is. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at Saul's um, fears, Saul, Saul's uh, commentary about Goliath, it, it doesn't say it's his height or, or, or his uh, strength. He talks about his skill. You would think if he was 10 feet tall, his first fear would be his height. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. One Samuel seven. And that and that is a simplification to uh, six cubits. They change the beat. <laughs> uh, um, and one other thing to consider yeah. is humans have kept getting larger throughout history. So even if you're basing it on arm hand. Right. I just said 10 feet would be exaggerative. The guy was huge. Right. Did you say 17? 117? <laughs> 117. One, one Samuel 17. Okay. The challenge of a lion. What were you saying? I was saying, um, it's like freshman, right? So like you take 10 and two. 7, 8 and a half feet, right? Right. So average. <laughs> so there we go. 
he and was never exaggerated. The average height of, of the Israelites at the time was between five and five feet and five six. Um, <laughs> King Saul, by the way, was over six feet tall. Oh, wow. Saul was very tall. Even though the footprint existed. Yeah, one of the um, no, indicators of that is just the description of him. Probably an indication they ate a lot of meat. Usually, heights around that and cultures are tied to meat consumption. Well, and genetics. There were taller people, genetically. Um, Israelites, Jews, not, not very tall people. My people are not tall. Case in point. Taller than us. Is that your favorite one? Is that your food that you're actually like that you can trace yourself back? Look at my eye. <laughs> the Philistines drive the horses from Adam at Soka and Judah, and camp between Soka and Asaka at his dominion. A champion lion of Gad came out from the Philistine camp. We hear they all six and a half feet tall, so six and a half feet tall. Uh -huh. He had a bronze helmet on his head, on a bronze horse that was steel armor, weighing 5,000 shekels. Very great strippers. And bronze greaves or bronze scimitar spun from a bowl. The shaft of his javelin was like a weaver's head alone. Its iron head weighed 600 shekels. Yeah, the His shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted out the ranks of Israel. Why God died in formation? I feel the scene you were soul servants. She's one of the men who haven't come down to me. He beats me in combat and kills me, you'll be your vassals. If I beat him and kill him, your vassal and servants. Continue, I defy the next visual of the day. Give me a man, and let us fight together. And if you go down to, let's see, where is the uh, reverse? Um, and then if you look at chapter 17, in 1733, when David offers to fight Goliath, Saul answered David, You cannot go up against this Philistine and fight with him, if you're only a youth. He's been a warrior from his youth. Right. He doesn't say he's a giant, which you would think would be his first mention. His first mention is. And so there's a couple of different. Uh, one commentator, one article I read was interesting, but again, it, it, it very much is somewhat speculating. Was the, the fact that he has a shield bearer walk before him is, is that because he is. That's a big gigantism. Um, and so the problem with gigantism is yes, he's very big and very strong. Uh, but you also are very delicate, You're very fragile, um, and so people, uh, there was you know, people like under, under the giant, uh, who was you know, an actor. I think he was only seven foot, only seven foot six, uh, <laughs> but he had a very bad back. And, and he, he's, the, he's the man who acted the Princess Bride. Have you seen that yep. Bride? So he, he acted the Princess Bride, but he couldn't pick up um, the actors. That was all done through wires because his back was so bad. Uh, he was a really strong man. He could even crush his helmets, but because he had a bad back and that weak, those weak joints, he couldn't pick, pick her up to catch her. Um, when they're doing the fight and he's on the guy's on his back, it's actually just a sack, a black sack filled with like sand. Because mm, okay. if he had actually gotten up on his back, the guy would kill him. Yeah, but it yeah. collapsed his spine. And so, and so Robert, and again, the example of Robert Ludlow was eight, eight foot eleven. Uh, they had to walk with a cat. And so again, what mm -hmm. speculates is there a shield bear walking before him because he's actually kind of weak? You know, he's big, but is he fragile? Um, one of those things where you have options. Um, and unfortunately, again, there's evidence for both. But I think the, the bigger idea, the most main idea, is, is this is a tough warrior who's scared, mm -hmm. right? Scary. What about the weight of his coat of mail and of his spear? So, what is a shuttle? Money. <laughs> it is it money? <laughs> but into it. Obviously, and again, that is a good question. So, I went and looked at the Jewish Encyclopedia in 1905, and they gave two different weights depending on the time. <laughs> So a shekel is either about 16 and a bit grams or about 8 grams. 
I've noticed much like the qubit, it seems like they just cut everything in half at one point, or either that or double it. Inflation. <laughs> and so working it out, according to this measurement, it's about 92 pounds or 185 pounds. Now, I want to look up other places. I was curious to know if we worked it out. And, and the common consensus seemed to be about either 125 or 150 pounds. I guess they're taking the between those two measurements to get to where it comes from. It's heavy. Yeah. Um, and I'm looking at an article by somebody, there was an article I read that was interesting. Um, they're looking at, they're seeing, is this description fitting, uh, would, it, would it fit time period with those students? And the article said, yes, it did. But it's about, tw it's about twice as heavy. as the heaviest armor found in the area. And the spear is about equal to that. So, so 600 shekels is about 18 pounds. The average spear is between three pounds to six pounds, which sounds really light. Remember, you have to pick up and throwing it and carrying it and actually it's heavy. <laughs> um, so about eight, about two, so two to three times heavier than the average persons. Uh, but he was twice as big, so that he was twice as big. He was twice as big, um, and even with, with with seven feet tall, he was only seven feet tall. You know, um, you look. I mean, and there, and there are people today who are weightlifters who are that tall. There's some of the wrestlers, some of the other there's like actors like that. These are big guys, um, and you stand them up next to somebody five foot nothing, and David is running the adult was probably on five feet or less. Um, you know, an a, a adolescent youth who's probably a skinny guy, yeah. and yeah, he's gonna probably about here on the way. You know, he's gonna weigh less than half of him. Um, this is not gonna be a fair fight. Right. He's you know. fast. <laughs> Well, even at seven feet tall, again, if he's yeah, a warrior, yeah. yeah. But you get somebody seven feet tall who's fighting for youth, they're also pretty fast. And strong. And strong, and, and probably not um, someone you'd want to face. <laughs> it's no All that extra armor weight might have been to help him stand up straight if he had back problems. That is one of the theories, yeah, that they had those extra stuff. And so the armor would have been. Basically, like a rope covered with with metal scales. So, what it would have been a cloth or a a lighter a rope that they would have sewn these metal rings on. Protection. From the description, there is a theory, and again, it's a theory. It's like a question mark on that. The description of the armor, the description of what he's carrying, seems to fit a particular class of warrior. Um, that that would have meant something um, at the time. But this is a question mark, it's not stated in the, the Bible, it's just, you know, it could have been an unusual guy who just wore strange armor, it could have been some class of warrior. The elite warriors of the Philistines were chariots. Um, the elite soldiers would have been charioteers. At the time, there were three, um, the Philistines met to the three man chariots. So one was the driver, one was the shield bearer, catching against any missiles, and one was the actual warrior. And there's a word that appears in Scripture of Goliath, a champion, which doesn't actually mean literally champion. So again, back to 1 Samuel 1 17. If I'm going too fast, stop me. If I'm boring, you stop me too. So, 117, verse 4. A champion in the life of God came out of the Philistine camp. That word is literally mean champion. That's how it's being translated. It actually literally means the one. In between. 
Now, does this mean you know, that he's referring to the fact that he came out between the two armies? He says, come fight me, you'll have to sell this in the combat. We just see that's how it's being used in the English translation. He's the one who comes up as the champion, the elite warrior between the two armies. Or is it the battle between these two chariots? And so the one article that I read on this, we're talking about the armor and the way was it the fit with the time period, said this would have been an unusual sight to see a three person chariot here. This is something that the Hebrews had, that other people had. And so this trying to describe this. It would have made sense that the Hebrews would have said he's the dude in the military. Um, also, the armor that he carries and the weapons he carries would have fit what was being from the pictures we have of the time. They have one short sword, a sword, a sword on the back, comes off the chest, a spear, then a shoe bear. He doesn't carry the shield, he's a shoe bear. If there were the three man charioteers, there would have been a guy pecking. So, would this, would this have been Goliath and his friend who would have worked with him? Uh, the driver of the company and this can take care of horses. Uh, maybe. But the leader of the army would have been the charioteers. Um, he would have been the one of the great warriors. He's dressed as this way. Um, interesting, uh, no way to prove it either way, unfortunately. <laughs> um, there's just not there. Um, also, uh, for you, Jacob, Goliath be translated as stranger. I was going to ask you to do it. <laughs> and there's a couple other places where the same name is used, but for other people. And so is it a title? Is the name? Is it both? Who knows? But it doesn't mean stranger. So um, there is in 2 Samuel 21, I believe, Goliath's four sons, also called his giants, are killed by David's men. But there's only in a, in a, in a one verse description, and there's no, no battle. It's a much less famous story. The one of them was also probably called Lions of Manuscripts. Uh, okay. Good so far? Okay. So Goliath goes out and he, he offers a fight by proxy, a fight by champion, and this happened. It wasn't was common, it didn't happen. It happened around the world. There's, there's a script of this Roman military history, there's of this the Greek history, of the Odyssey. Uh, the samurai warriors in China and Japan would do this. Um, and so this isn't an unheard of thing, but it's unusual. Um, the difficulty is keeping both sides to this, right? Sometimes you know, the two champions you agree with, so all would be killed, I don't know if they were killed, and it would be a bigger fight. But sometimes it's a prelude to a bigger war. Um, but it did happen. It did happen. Um, the thing about this is King Saul is supposed to ask for challenge. It was the job of the king to lead. It was the job of the king to, to take up these challenges, the job of the king to fight and have to speak. And if, as some suggest, Goliath is only seven feet. Saul would have been that much shorter. Saul is described as being over, as being head shoulders above the rest of the battle. Um, you find that verse for your quick, first Samuel. Uh, Saul is a big, strong man. Uh, Saul is not weak. Uh, one of the reasons why he's picked the first one. Um, so in chapter 9, verse 2. Um, I'm sorry, it's 1st Samuel, check it out. 9, verse 2. He had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man on the floor of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upwards, he was taller than any of the people. Yeah, so in other words, so 5, 6 of them here. And he looked good, too. He looked good. <laughs> he's called Grace. He's from a brave style with families. Um, so he's a tall guy, he's a big guy, he's over six feet tall, so maybe it's, he's six two, six three, and if, if Goliath is only six eight or six nine, you know, it, it's a difference. But 
but not as much as between David and Saul. It was Saul's job to dwell with the people. It was Saul's job to dwell with them. And so when Saul held back, when Saul did this defiant, this is a shame. And part of it goes back to the thing that Saul knows what? He's been rejected by God. Saul knows that God is not there. Saul knows that because of his sin, that God had drawn his right. We see here the roots of, of his envy and his anger and theirs. And so Saul refuses to fight. And because Saul refuses to fight, he refuses to fight. As the days drag on, Armor gets more and more terrified and demoralized and afraid. Enter David. David's still a shepherd. David is, is still a shepherd boy. He goes every once in a while they play for, for King Saul. They calm him down from the melancholy. He sent by his dad to go and bring some food for his brothers and some cheese to command her as a salute and check on the, the bad that's going. You know, go to see what's happening to your, your brothers for the script that you don't know. And he goes there and he is horrified at this challenge. He, why is that hit? Answer this challenge. And they're, they're kind of saying, hey, hey, look why I'm having a challenge. <laughs> you know, Goliath, you know, come on. Um, and David wants to offer the challenge. They take him to King Saul. And again, Saul's protest doesn't, it's not about Goliath's too strong, he's too big, he's too fierce. It's, you know what you're doing. You're a shepherd. Goliath is a warrior. He's from a family of warriors and fighting the battles. He was a man. You were youth. Do we know how old he was? We don't know how old he was. Um, we know he was older than 13, but younger than probably 16 to 18, somewhere in there. Uh, but there's no. I didn't search for that yet. Yeah. Um, And at this moment, you know, David replies this. David says, oh, the first the first Samuel in chapter 17. David spoke to Saul. But not your majesty lose courage. I am at your service to go and fight the service. But Saul answered David. You can also go up against the Philistine and fight him. You're only you. Well, he's been a warrior from us. And David told Saul, Your servant used to tend his father's sheep without guessing. You never a lion or bear from the hair off the sheep of the squaw. I would go after it, attack and wrestle it from the prayer of his mouth. If it attacked me, I would seize him by the jaw and strike him and kill him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be as one of them who insulted the armies of the living God. David continued. The Lord who delivered me from the claws of the lion and the bear will also keep me safe from the clutches of the Philistine. So answer David, go, the Lord be with This is a, a very startling thing in that many ways. The first of all, when David says he's protected by God against lions and bears, <laughs> this is you what know, has happened with his bare hands. You know, this, these are feats. These are impressive feats. You know, a lion or a bear to kill them. <laughs> what? With your bare hands. <laughs> yeah. 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 A, a lion or a bear could kill someone. These are our bear cubs and lion cubs. <laughs> um, and so, so what David is saying is, I have God on my side. And God protect me. And I have been in situations just as dangerous. And I went and attacked and I fought them and, and God was there. And God would get. And so, and this one is desperate. It's been 40 days. 
And that number could be symbolic. Uh, you know, symbolic number 40. The 40 days of penance, 40 days of the desert, 40 days of sin. Uh, so at this point, it's that it's okay. Good luck. You know, at least I'm going to face it. Doesn't that agree to if David loses, they're going to be the slaves? So. Yeah, but if they don't fight, then they've lost anyway. Um, because the armor's not going to fight. If Saul will lead them, the king won't lead them. If their general is afraid to fight, what's going to happen to the army? Yes. So basically, Saul's saying, okay, at least you go. So, I don't have to die, at least you'll die. Like, you know, this, this place, Saul is showing my cowards. And then he clothes David in his own life. So symbolically, what's happening? Saul is passing on the kingship to David. Now, he's not doing this right. I mean, you, you can see in the story, Saul is not happy with David being hit in the battle. Saul wants Saul more now. Saul is very happy. He's very jealous. But symbolically, he's passing on to David the glory of the kingship. He says, you're going to lead by the man. You're going to wear my armor of the king. They are going to defeat the armies who are fighting the war against God. All this job, all he's supposed to be doing. And David puts this all on and says, like, This is too cumbersome. Are you still wearing these? Take them off. And so David both takes the kingship and rejects Saul's way of doing things. David is replacing Saul. Symbolically here, David replaces Saul as king, as leader, as general, as one taking care of the people of God. He does so not in the ordinary human way, as obsession or to fight, to strike, to be power, but he does so in confidence in God. He does so relying upon God, recognizing God with him, and trusting him in God's direction. See, Saul does not trust God. Saul refuses to believe God's promises. Saul refuses to believe God's with him. Saul says, this is much me. I can't do it. Do I have to beat me? David says, God's with us. This is why we have this not a problem. Why are we afraid? We have God on our side. It's happened before, I mean, the lion is very attacked, there's been a problem there. This is mean, it's different. And the size of the army, or the size of the champion, or the, or the defeats, or the dozens. We have a living God with us. The living God is a reference going back to, of course, to God's name. What is God's name in Exodus chapter 3? Yahweh, which means I am who I am. Or the existing one. So the living God is a reference to this. He is the ever living one. He's the one who is alive. Also, it's a comparison between, between the true God and the idols. They're not living, they're not alive. They're, they're stone, they're wood, they're imaginary. We have God on our side. It's going to be great. And Saul wasn't that much older. So he wasn't like an old dude. No, he wasn't an ancient, you know, you know guy who might walk around with cash. No. Should have been his, uh, his God. David then goes out armed with a sling and five stones. The church fathers see the five stones as very important, very small. Think of the number five. What, what, what's the year? Think of five. What, 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 what in? Five things of Christ. The of Christ. The wounds of Christ. Which slays the giant. Slays the devil, slays sin, slays death. Absolutely. The church fathers do actually see this as a reminder of how death and sin are slain. The devil is slain. Be a conqueror of the Bible of us. So, five stones picked out from the desert, put into a sling. They go out. After 40 days, 
in the lives of believers. Now what's John? He's prepared for a trap. He wasn't expecting that every month and a half or no one come out. And all of a sudden, he's out there with his armor, making fun of God, making fun of the Israelites, waiting for the, they're going to start breaking cap and fleeing very soon. They only face one man. So all of a sudden, he sees this young boy come out and the staff and no one. And you're going to lie at this point. Like, what do you think? This, this is ridiculous. This is a challenge. What do you mean? Is this is you see your saying? No. And he says, Am I a dog? Come out me with the staff. You, 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 you think you think I so bad? Come here to me and I'll leave your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. In other words, you're not scared, you're not there. And the response is you come against me with sword and spear and scimitar, but I come against you in the name of the Lord thy hosts. To God the army of Israel that you insult. Today the Lord shall deliver you to my hand. I will strike you down and go off your head. This very day I will leave your corpse, the corpse of the Philistines, of the army, and the birth of the beasts of the field. The whole land of Israel will have it all. And this whole constitution learned that it is not by swords that the Lord saves. The battle is the Lord, it's living into our hands. So up to this point, Lyoth could kind of beg off and say it's a ridiculous fight to somebody else. He's been challenged now. Basically, he's told, you know, if you leave now, you're afraid. So Lyoth is a challenge, Lyoth can't stand it. And David recognizes exactly what's going on. You know, David says, you know, this isn't, humanly speaking, this isn't an ordinary fight. I'm coming at you not with human weapon, I'm not with human armor, I'm at you something better. In the name of the Lord Christ. May I you the power of God and myself. God is God is our strength. We have you Goliath, we have God. We're good. Now you know the story. If this lead he Goliath comes at him, David takes a stone to sling, hits him, and the forehead he falls down. And David comes up his head. So again, for Jacob especially, <laughs> how effective is this thing as a weapon? Very. <laughs> Recently, a little boy defended his sister from getting abducted or something yeah. with a slingshot. Yeah. Slaying and a slingshot mm -hmm. are not the same thing. Yeah. It is if you're skilled with them. So you can smack something through them. Much larger than yeah, slings are like really big, right? Didn't they? So the sling would have been like a piece of rope, like about this big. Yeah. 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 Actually, a, a, an experienced slinger could, could shoot farther than arrows. Um, a, a the speed of a slingshot is about a hundred miles an hour. It's like a gun. Yeah. 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 Um, all of our history, there were a elite core of slavers in many armies. Many, the most famous ones came from a region in Spain called the Galeric Islands. Um, the Romans used them, the Greeks used them. Um, uh, they were elite. Um, there was parts of the Roman soldiers where they would drill holes into their, sl their slingshots and make whistling noises. So you'd have this scary sound in the end. It was, it was well. Uh, it, it was a very uh, and people who knew what they were doing could, could, could be could shoot a lot faster than they had more ammo and, and they could shoot with more deadly, more deadly accuracy. And remember, there's shooting a projectile that's a skull in the size of a fist. Depending on the shell. Some the biggest ones would be about the size of the fist, smaller ones would be about the size of a bullet. But either way, it's not gonna feel good. Have you ever dropped a quarter in your toe? <laughs> it hurts. Um, th there was a Roman physician by the name of Celsus in the second century AD who describes having to remove slingshot uh, projectiles out of the flesh. How do you do it? There's a, a treatise on this that he writes. 
Um, go look it up, have fun. Um, but, yes, yeah, it's very important. The reason why more people didn't use them was because the bow and arrow could turn it very quickly. To be an effective slinger, for whatever reason, uh, you had to train for your child. Um, the, the most famous sling, slingers, this was the first toy that gave their children, was a slingshot. So at 20 years old, you're already playing the slingshot. Um, yeah. And because, because this was how they made their money, so they did how they break their economy, was based upon the mercenaries to out to all of the elite forces. Um, you know, a bow and arrow, you can go around as an adult. Slingshot, you can't. Or not to be effective. Um, if you pick a slingshot, you might end up hitting someone behind you. Bow and arrow, at least know what it creates space. Um, now, does this mean David been trained this as a young man? Mm -hmm. Is this a miraculous shot? Or does this mean that the David just knew what he was doing? Probably a bit of both. You know, David probably practiced. Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. He's a teenager. He loves weapons. That's just intrinsic to being a teenager. Exactly. is carrying around. Um, but so very effective, very good weapon. Um, but definitely got under jeans and takes care of. Um, some people even see some commentary to the fact that they have fallen from the space before David, as again, the bound of the false gods to the true God, the humbling of the Philistine before the Israelites. Um, at this point, when the when everyone sees that Goliath is dead, the Israelites rally and there is a great defeat, and they go and they chase the Philistines away and they kill them. <coughs> And then the women of the town of Jerusalem, the area, begin to sing this, this song. Saul has slain his thousands. But David has slain tens of thousands. And Saul, who was so afraid to go out and fight, refused to do his job, refused to lead his king, refused to take care of the problem, is very jealous. He's very envious. And at this point, he decides to kill David. David has just defeated this problem for him. David has just been a hero. And because David is praying for doing what he wanted to do, okay. Saul's a cadet. It's not, it's not that they're singing, Saul's a coward, David's a hero. They're, they're saying Saul's a hero. Saul's our king, Saul's defended us, Saul's helped us, Saul, but David's a bigger hero. It's not, they're not, not even saying that, that Saul is a bad person. But at this point, Saul is jealous of David and decides to kill him. He decides to kill him exactly for doing his job is that to be the hero. So the reward of David for doing the right thing is he now has the, the hate of the king. David, Saul's son Jonathan, the oldest son, comes with friends with David. Um, Jonathan, unlike his father, um, appreciates what he's done done for the people. Um, becomes a good friend. They're very, very close. Um, and his youngest daughter, Nicole, um, Basically, gets a big crush on that. And now, um, and Saul tries to figure out how to trap. And his first trap is uh, that beautiful man. First, Saul is back in the melancholy, and as David is playing for him, Saul, in a bit of rage, takes a spear, tries to kill him. And so David actually went out of the room and fly. But this, this is a little temper of life. It's, it's not academic. It's not, you know, the king trying to kill you. Then Saul has this bright idea and he says, David, David, my boy, my daughter Nicole likes you a lot. You like her. 
Um, I guess it's sort of to suggest that that day would go to Saul and say, give me the hand of your daughter right now. Because Saul is a favorable to you. He's trying to kill this people. <laughs> but, you know, I guess times pass. It's the during a bit of, a bit of my day. I wouldn't think, what have I done? How horrible I was. You know, it, was, it, was that, it was that darn melancholy in which I couldn't help myself. Let's get past. And when David kind of protects his whole mind and marrying the, the king's daughter, um, basically the message was back to him all I want is go and kill a hundred of Right? So this is to send him off by himself to get on Maybe with a small bag. Um, and then his, his thought is, he's going to be killed. You know, he's going to, you know, this will go off, it'll go off by himself. So okay. in, in his zeal to get my daughter to walk and kill, he will um, get out of my hair and I can say, well, it's me, he lost this great hero. You know, he went off to do this great deed and he failed, but really sad about it. You know, no one can lend you that way. And David comes back with 200 heads. Saul so decides, please. And Saul so decides he's going to kill David in his sleep. Uh, so he does give him his daughter, the Cole Mary. Uh, they are married. And the Cole realizes that Saul is going to get her dad to kill him. And so she gets him out the window and she makes a you know, basic equivalent of putting pillows in the bed. <laughs> his father shows him pillows, makes his pillows in the bed while he escapes out of the he, he, He's a hundred men. And so David goes from being this great hero, no fault of his own, now he's being pursued by Saul. He's not allowed. He's been rejected by the king for doing the right thing. One of the lessons here for us is all too often we expect if we do the right thing, people are going to praise us. If we do the right thing, or at least the Christians are not going to be on our side. Right? At least, if we can understand that the bad people are, are going to be against us, the truly good people will, will, will be help us and agree with us and be proud of us and praise us. And that's a great way. But that's not always true, is it? Look at politics. <laughs> look at politics, look at religion, look at the saints. Um, you know, the greatest sufferings of, of our Lord were, were, were from the, the Romans or from his apostles, from his fellow people. You know, and it's something we see over and over in the Bible and we keep, and we keep forgetting. We keep expecting, if, if I if pray well, if I present for truth, the right thing, at least everyone, at least, yeah, maybe, you know, the pagans or the wicked people in the post But But everyone else prays. And that's not the case. We need, be, we need to be prepared to face challenges from even our own son, from fellow Christians, perhaps from leaders, perhaps from people in God's service. Um, the great persecutors in the first century, you know, the apostles, were, were the men who up to the, the priests, the rabbis, the, uh, their, 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 their country, their friends, their neighbors. The prophets, when they persecuted, when they persecuted them, aren't the pagans, it's their fellow friends. King David is persecuted by his king, he swore his oath no, to his more life to His father in law, which again, that culture would basically be the father. You know, it's commander in chief. All the people that he cares about are seeking his life. But he says the right thing anyway. And one of the great verses of David, David is a complicated figure. Uh, David is very, is a, both virtuous and very simple at the same time. And we'll see throughout his life, David, even, when, even though he sins, he always has, has this idea of, of, of being true to God, and being faithful to God, and walking in the right way. Even when he's opposed. David flees, ironically enough, 
first to Gath. Where was Gath? Where were her name for? So he flees to Philistine territory? He flees to Philistine territory. Because Philistine territory is out of the power of Saul. Um, but, but the king of Gath isn't very pleased with that. <laughs> at first, so David has to, has to pretend he's, he's mad. Um, but as time moves on, David, no, he does escape from the king. Um, David goes to the wilderness of Ziklag, goes to the desert and caves, and gradually men begin to join him. Eventually, a 600 men join him. And some of them are offerings. These aren't all virtuous, holy men, because David is this great, virtuous leader. These are outlaws, these are the people who are dissatisfied with soul. These are rebels. He is poor. Were there any Philistines that joined him, or just. Not that are described at this point. Um, it would have been the men and, and their families. But it says 600 men. I think 600 soldiers. But it would have been their wife, their children, perhaps any servants, their livestock. It's a, a little village. Sizable settlement. Yeah, a um, And the settlement of the village. And so, that's the man in chase. So was that for the arms. Two different periods. Saul is close to David. Saul, Saul comes up to David. And David goes down in the middle, middle of the army of, of King Saul by himself with, with a little bit of His own guy. The first time he goes down there, um, cuts off the hem of Saul's robe. The second time he takes the spear and the jug by Saul's head. Both times the man killed. They said, David, look. We stuck into their camp. He's right in front of us. I want to take a monster to kill me. He's sleeping. At that point, then, your fight's over. You're free. You'll kill this man. He's unjust to you. Think of all the stuff he's done to you. Think of how unfair he's been to you. Think of how he's treated you. You kill him, your problems are over. But you're a hero to everyone else. You are the son in law of the king. They're going to care. And David's response is, I cannot kill the Lord's one. Anointed him. God chose Saul. God anointed Saul, the prophet Samuel. I cannot treat him as a murderer or a thief. I have to treat him as the Lord's one. God's put him in his hands. Both times, the camp has fallen into a deep sleep. Either Saul really bad at praying soldiers or God's in their Probably the second. Everyone's asleep, everyone's knocked out, no one's stirring. Saul, David and his companion are right there in the middle of the camp. There's all kinds of guards around with their watchmen. They're all asleep. Both times. Both times. This is not a natural curse. Both times, it's close enough to stay from the camp by the head of Saul. One time he cuts part of Saul's clothing off. <coughs> He refuses to attack those one. And the second time it happens, um, Saul basically says, Well, I guess you're right, not me. I'll leave you alone. He's not walking him back. He's just saying, I'm not going to see you anymore. Saul goes back to King Achish of Gath. Make a deal with him. David's now a fix. David goes to King uh, Gath of Gath, make a deal with him. And the king basically gives him a portion of land, the territory, and says, You fight for me, you be one of my you be one of my, my men, or host me, I live for And so David, for the next several years, well, I don't know the exact number of years, but for the next many, for several years, decade or so, lives in those territories. 
He is considered a general of the Philistines. He's an outlaw to this. A couple of lessons we learn from David's treatment of Saul. And the first is the importance of the fourth man. Fourth man as well. Honor your father and mother. It also includes spiritual things. It includes uh, devil It includes you know, all of which Saul would have been as anointed, anointed by, by God, chosen by God, picked by God. And so David here is saying, even though Saul's in the wrong, I still have to respect and treat him as my king. How do you think this might apply to our time? <laughs> was that there? Was that done? Uh, yeah. Pope. Perhaps Pope? What about the Pope? You don't want to say it, do you? I would say any positions of authority. Yeah. President, president, any major agreement. There are structures in the providence of God and as part of a civilized society, that's how we operate. Otherwise, it's pure anarchy, everyone for themselves, their own ideal, taking that into your own hands. And you also respect the office and position, even if the man in that position of office is looking. Um, and so, if there was a bishop or a pope mm -hmm. or a priest who was not doing their job, um, it doesn't mean he'll kill him. It doesn't mean he's good. It oh, doesn't mean. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> well, at least when, when act like King David, you can. When act like Saul, you know, go ahead. You have to send him an Easter card. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. We have this example where, where the author is respected and it's placed in God's hands. Um, and this doesn't mean they tolerate the wickedness. Doesn't mean pretend it's not there. This doesn't mean you ignore it. But it means you can't take it into your own hands. Say, you know, we're going to go the strike team and get rid of the president or the, you know, fill in the blank. Which is at times all the one to us. Wish we could. Um, but we're being called here to recognize God is still in charge. And see, if God is in charge when Goliath attacked, God is in charge when Saul if God is protecting, guiding, and leading when the pagans are attacking, He's also protecting, guiding, and leading when those who are, who are acting in the name of God, the false God is still in charge. God is still the protector, defender, and the one leading His people. And this is something that we need to talk about. You also have this here the grace of God in the name of Saul is still the Lord's anointed. Saul, you know, David doesn't say, you know, because Saul did A, B, and C to me, because Saul did this thing to me, therefore it's not David's the anointed. He's on the kingship, he's lost his rights, he's lost. He says, oh, Lord, I can't touch him. It would be a sacrilege and offense to God if I were to attack him. I still owe This is my father. If I were to attack him, it would make me wicked. And so God never withdraws grace, but he lets us reject grace. See, there's a long period of time where Saul couldn't have redeemed himself. Right? So Saul, yes, abandoned God, rejected God, or obeyed to obey God. In this period of time, though, where he could have many years, so he could have returned to God and asked forgiveness and changed. He doesn't. God keeps offering chances to David, the Philistines. But Saul could have. Didn't God also send the evil spirit into Saul and made him throw the spear at David? But he allowed. Right. So, you were know, here last week. So, so uh, when it says that it's from the Lord. He's playing both sides of the ball. 
This phrase from the Lord does not mean that God up there is saying, I want you to be wicked, I'm going to do bad things. That's not God. What it means is that two things. One, God allows Saul to suffer. In the same way that in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, it says that Saul hardened Pharaoh's heart. It doesn't mean that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Uh, it doesn't mean that God's up there literally saying to Pharaoh, you know, don't do this, you know, take a better time for you. What it means is that because Pharaoh rejected grace, God was off for him. Because Pharaoh pushed away, away God's help, God would draw us. That if we choose sin, the more we choose sin, the very first time we choose sin, God's going to write that meaning. Or we choose it, the further off God's going to be. Not because God is bad, it's God saying, choose sin. But because God is, is allowing us to push him away. The same thing's true of the evil spirit from the Lord. Because Saul rejecting God's grace, God is allowing Saul to suffer. What's the purpose then? Conversion. A humble man would say, look at what's happening. I rejected God, and now I have, have this oppression, I have this, this, this suffering, I have this trial. What should I do? Turn to the Lord and ask forgiveness. Turn to the Lord and ask mercy. You see this many times in the life of David. When David sins and he's punished by God, the response isn't, what was me, forget God, I'm done. The response is, turn to the Lord and mercy and pity on me for sin. And God's response is always, I forgive you, you suffer, but I forgive you. Saul had this chance on his once, but again and again and again and again for years. It happens with the melancholy, the depression. It happens with the, with the Philistines, where Saul is given this chance to be a hero. And he abuses that. It happens with the Philistines, he chases David twice. He sees that David, again, David would have killed him. He spared twice. It happens for years. He's given this chance to come back to God to say, Lord, have mercy on me, Lord, forgive me, Lord, help me. David's in the right. I see more like David. And he doesn't. He stays jealous, he's arrogant, he stays set upon his ways. That's the tragedy of Saul's life. It's because God has told him. I'm not going to, because of what you did to me, because of how you rejected me, I'm not going to, to set your dynasty firm. They would be king after you. Saul would have banished God. Saul doesn't trust him. Saul doesn't believe God and forgive him. And because of that belief, because of that arrogance, because of his pride and envy and refusal to ask forgiveness, Saul fulfills his, his own prophecy. Right? You, see, you, say, you say, God can't forgive me, and guess what? God can't forgive Because you're not sorry for it. You're refusing, you're refusing to trust him. And so the story here of Saul is a warning to us. What happens we don't trust God? This is David is this, 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 this cry of us to repent, even if we're terrible sinners. And David's terrible sinners. We'll see that next week. David's a great sinner. He sins in many ways. He's, and, and David is quite punished by for it. He loses his children, his kingdom comes not evil, he uh, is not able to death. But he returns to God, he seeks God, he has to forgive us, he recognizes his sin, he is a saint. Man for God's own heart. The contrast between Saul and David is something we should be shaken apart. I recognize and say, if I fall, if I fail God, what's my response? Am I a David or a Saul? Am I a Peter or a Judas? The record of my sins will have mercy on me, which case I do. Or by the Judas and my Saul say, my sin's too big for God, I'm king, I'm an apostle, whatever. 
and a bad God. To the suffering that God sends isn't because God is a me. It's because God is calling Saul back and his son is humbling Saul. And Saul's response is to be humble to the sailor of God. And Saul's response is, I forget God. He uses this as an excuse to do more evil. It's a tragedy of Saul's life. David was something we thought there. That's the only out of comments. Seems like Saul was set up to fail from the get go, right? Because God didn't want the people to have a king, but they begged for a king, so he gave him a king good and hard. And he gave him a flawed individual like Saul. It almost seems like he's got mental problems, right? With depression and the, you know, throwing the spear, David was playing the clear for him. It's like he's like he deliberately picked a flawed human. Who of us is not flawed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next week, I think. Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of us that come a little closer than the others. Yeah, still, we're, we're all flawed. We're all broken. Uh, you see, even David, you know, was a murderer. And not just a bad one, but a murderer. David's an adulterer. David's greedy. David's selfish. David's a bad dog. Again, it's almost like it was set up. To fail would be a, a life lesson for the rest of us. No, um, so neither Judas nor Saul is at the bed. People have the second question about Judas. Uh, you know, I was going to say, right. my dad always trained. said that you about Judas. Like, yeah. you don't have a He was like set up to be the god of the scapegoat. And, and, and that, that is, is not the lesson. Uh, no, no. Uh, so, so God is never out there thinking people, not copies. You don't believe that God's out there saying, uh, I, you know, that if you're going to hell, I'm going to use your life lesson, and you're, there's no choice but to go. Um, <coughs> sometimes in the language, we only see one side of the story because it, it, it's a lesson for us. It's a lesson for us. We're being told something. Uh, but the, so we are, we're, that's being emphasized, that side of it. Because it is something we're supposed to learn. But look at it from the point of view of God, the point of view of the whole, the whole, the bigger picture. Well, why the Damascus faces the first all And so, so the pagan nations, who are the enemies of Israel, who are the enemies of God, who are um, punished by God, who are put in the bad times. What's the point of that? The point of that is that God is limiting sin, limiting evil, and trying to convert everybody. That God is trying to put their soul back. He does so in a way to understand. And so the first thing is that God has this modern idea that sin is not worthy of death. That death is, is, is the worst thing in the world. It's not. Sin is the worst thing in the world. Sin is far worse. Because of that, you go to heaven. The sin, you go to heaven. We've lost the sense. But the second thing is, is that every human being has the call of God, the grace of God to succeed. Neither Judas nor Saul is forced to betray God. If it wasn't Judas, then it would have been somebody else. Like, I guess. He still could have asked for forgiveness after. Yeah. Yeah, um, there would have been somebody in the group that was not necessarily to go not like necessarily. Uh, so part of the confusion I think is that when there's a prophecy, the prophecy is not from our point of view. I <laughs> Not poor free. Prophecy. <laughs> Excellent question. I really appreciate you. This is great. Um, so prophecy, we're used to, you know, it's one of the, 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 the modern trope in, in, in modern literature, right? Any fancy novel, any fancy movie in the last 15 years, it's going to be, there was a chosen one who went prophecy. 
right now, I haven't seen this literature and books and movies. Um, because we have this idea that prophecy dictates the future. That because the prophet said this in the past, therefore this must be so in the future. But this is not the prophecy. It's prophecy is not set in the future in stock. Prophecy is not making the future be what it's going to be. There would be no free will. No free will. But also it would differ because of where prophecy comes from. See, the thing about a my understanding of prophecy, of all saying prophecy, is you kind of think of prophecy as this, um, this setting people with a certain power. In order to fulfill this, they had to do a certain way. They had to do it this way because of the prophecy. God sees all things as present. And so when God says this will happen, it's not because God is saying, of course this will happen. God is saying, I know this will happen. Because for him it's happened. And it's not that God is making it happen, of course it to happen, or causing it to happen. Just from our perspective, because we're trapped in time. From our perspective, it looks that way because we are seeing it unfolding. What is the center of history? Who is the center? Jesus. Jesus. The center of history. And so for God, everything else flows from our Lord. Everything else flows from Jesus. Jesus is the point, the center, the goal, the fulfillment. Everything what comes to come in. Think of it this way. Um, this is a fault. Let me make clear. This is false. <laughs> uh, Think of it this way. If I were to wrap a present, I, I get you a nice book. I put it in a box, I put it wrapped in paper, put a ribbon on it. What do I see first? I see the book first. Then the box, and the paper, and the ribbon. What do you see first? The ribbon, the paper, the then the box, and only then the book. You see a backwards because it's happening in a different way. For us in time, we see things that are in line. This happens, or this happened, this happened, this happened. For God, God is all things. This is the point of history. That all things come from us. God directs things that way. And so when God has a prophecy, it's not you know, it's a prophecy of It's not because God caused it to happen. It's because Saul caused it to happen. It's because all of these things happen. Um, and so, yes, there are prophecies that, that David is going to be king, the prophecies that precisely going to happen. There are prophecies that Jews will try to And so, I, I don't think you should say that if Jews had done it, someone else would have. That's not necessarily true. Um, then how could he have been betrayed and how could why would he? That's the wrong question, because again, God just knew he already knows. God knew it. He already knows that. Oh, he's going to see him. Yeah. Got it. Uh, um, it's, it's not that someone had to do it and Judas got, got chosen. God knew Judas. Yeah. yeah. Second version is that it's not God saying, I'm going to make this happen. It's God saying, I've already seen this happen. This is what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. It's just a different and, and in the same way that me saying to you, you know, if you drink too much, you're, you're going to kill yourself. It's not me causing you to kill yourself. Your actions, the actions of Judas, or the, the actions, actions of Saul, the actions of Judas. And so, yes, there are prophecies saying that David will be king after Saul. There are prophecies saying that Saul is re going to reject him. But that's not because God's setting him up. It's, it, it's God warning us. Um, Saul could have every choice, every chance to change his fate, to change this whole thing. And God will let him. And we have a different book. Different book. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're in the process. Different things happen. Um, but what has happened this way? I have a question. Yeah. So, both Judas and Saul yes. committed suicide. Yep. 
So what, how is that reflective? I mean, you know, suicide is a sin. Yeah, mortal sin. And a mortal sin, but, um, but if they were so against it, why did they commit suicide? I, I, I'm kind of not understanding. They were so bad. I mean, Judas, I can kind of understand, but Saul didn't seem to care about anything. He's about to die. Yeah, in so, Saul's case, it was to escape suffering. Oh, okay. Um, we'll, see, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he was he was facing defeat uh, from from the Philistine army. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, he was dying, and he wanted to escape suffering. Again, that counts. Um, okay. That, that, that lack of trust with God. All these things, I mean, right, I mean, I mean as Christians, you know, when I mean, you suffer at death, is that how you're being abandoned by God? No. You right? suffer at death, the most, the most. Yeah. Right? The good thing, the bad thing, both suffer at death, twice. And the one thing uses that as a place where he gets forgiven. This at this point is a call to Saul where he can call upon God. And that's how he can say, Lord of mercy. He's facing death. This is the one chance he had, one final chance to say, come back. The response is, it's hopeless. You kill myself. Um, and so all these things, we have chance after chance after chance that God gives him. And they're real chances. Um, and, and so yes, we know that he's taken. So it seems like he's failing. Each of these things are real chances. Same thing to Judas. When Christ calls Judas friend, he's not, he's not mocking him. He's not saying, hey friend, hey buddy, hey pal. He's saying, I care about you. I want you to come back. Um, he says, like, I know you're going to do this. He tells him. Okay. And, and, and again, it's not, it's not our Lord forcing him to do it. It's not him setting up for failure. It's not, it's not him saying, I picked you, too bad for you, go to hell. No. It's him saying, wake up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you still have a chance. Yeah. Did that one. Yeah, exactly. It says it would have been better for him if he had not been born. But he still, even even having betrayed Jesus, he still could have repented. Yep. And it like turned. He could have been a great saint. Instead, he hung himself or whatever. Yep. <laughs> Peter denied him three times too. Because his mother denied him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. He turned around and said, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And now he holds the keys to heaven. Like, I mean, Jesus could have. That's right. But he did something really terrible. Like, he, he, was, he, was, he was a treasure bearer. He could, he could have been the treasure bearer in heaven. At the Last Supper, when Jesus says that to him, does yeah. he. He already made arrangements yep. to be. Okay. So yes. he. Why does he act like. Is he just like acting when he, you know. Is acting like, oh, it's not going to be me. It's not me, is it? Is it just like pretending? Yeah, yeah. people know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. He was pushing yeah. it, but not from Jesus. I guess. Maybe. These are still his friends. Yeah. Just, the, the apostles are still, I mean, they didn't have their preachers. They're still his friends. There's still people that he's embarrassed to, I mean, if, if you get something bad, and I knew about it, and I said, you know, I know you're dumb. I'm not going to admit to you, you're right. Everyone I did this thing. You might say, I'm innocent. Get in there. I didn't do that. You, know, just, you, you might be embarrassed I know about it, and you're going to tell them I was say you're right. I did Yeah, so, so yeah. Because again, it's all this just lack of trust, this lack of, you know, discovery. So. And it is a cult. Because we have the same temptation, we have the same fears and, and the same temptation that when we sin, that maybe this time God doesn't know about. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, right. You know, That's it's, 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 <laughs> but it's a human way. Going back and having the dark, you know, maybe <laughs> maybe I'll do it anyway. No, no, no. Maybe I'll. You know, you know, and again, it, it's silly, so there is, it, it is stupid, but it is human. It is something we all kind of struggle with. Where, where when we sin, our thought is, well, I don't want to repent, that's too much work, or God can't forgive me, or, you know, 
it's, it's, you know, I've got about too many times, so I'm more than that. You know, all, all these W is the same place. Well, obviously, we're talking over and over again the scriptures. Um, but yeah. So, so, again, it's not that Saul is up for failure. It's that Saul fails. And there's consequences to failure, but God keeps calling them back to your next time. And so for us, from, from, you know, 3,000 years later, it looks like Saul is just failure his whole life. But that's not God who had that Saul. It's not like God pre wrote the story, I guess. <laughs> right. Because we, we have, all these people had got to make their own choices, just like we did. Yes. They had potential to do everything. Yeah. Yep. They did it, but they couldn't. Just like someday our story will be written, people go, man, an idiot. Why can't we do that? <laughs> or hopefully, hopefully, hopefully they'll say what heroes they were. <laughs> How amazing they were. <laughs> and so inspired by their lives. It was kind of along the same lines as Mary. I mean, she could have said no. Yes. She had free will to her, even though she was immaculately conceived. And I mean, it was known from the beginning that, but she, so then what? What Adam and Eve I mean, you know, I mean, would they chose us? I, I, if Mary had said no, God would have saved us, but it wouldn't have been that. He would have picked somebody else, or she was the only did one. ask somebody for her, and she said no. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. But yeah, no, it would have been, if God would say it, it would have been this way. It wouldn't have been God would have been. And because it's, it's a whole different thing. Whole, like, whole like, different. Adam and Eve, it was yeah. Jesus. And then, yeah. okay. I just say he's God is all knowing. So right. he knows. He knew that she would see you. That's why she was conceived without yeah. sin and all he already But but knowledge is not causation. Right. right. Um, it's just because God knows it's happening and has happened, will happen, isn't God causing it to happen. Right. Um, which again, sometimes we can do that for ourselves a little bit. But you would say, like with the prophecy, it, mm -hmm. it, it's like how there's the prophecies of what will come and everything, and Mary comes and says, I pray and we'll change this. Yeah. So it's not set in stone. It's not set in stone. Now, after it happened, it's happened. <laughs> right. You know, you can't go back in time and change it. But yeah, no, there, there, there's plenty of these things. And the story of Saul, that's what, that's what I, I think you should read it. It's just to see how many times God calls Saul back. How many times God begs Saul to come back. Not just once, but over and over and over and over again. Just like the Pharaoh. Just like the Pharaoh. Just like the Pharaoh. Just like the Pharaoh. And they said, well, hopefully, when we have to finish it, is our story going to be inspiring and beautiful or not? Yeah. <laughs> so it means people were. Um, it is 7.25. Should I try to finish this next part in 10 minutes? Or. Okay. I'll probably finish it. Yes. So. David goes back and he makes this agreement with, with the king of, 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 of Gath, the king, gets some town and part of the family. And for a time he, he lives and he dwells, lives and he dwells um, with the king. Now even though Saul is kind of is in his own area of trust, uh, King Akish or Gath says to David, You're going to be, to be my body. Right? It's, it's a trust someone making them your body. Uh, even if they live apart. Uh, he's a shield bearer, he's, he's a great warrior. They go back and war and so on. And, and David's not in the way. David says, You know what? David, sit this one out. You know, these are your countrymen, this is it's the king you left behind. You don't really trust me. 
And Saul goes and he begs God for an answer. What do I do? And when he gets no answer, Saul goes and he's all the way. Saul goes to, at this point, Samuel's dead. Saul goes to a medium, a witch, the place called Endor. It's even spelled the same way. Yes, Endor is Lucas Barr's name when it says Planet Stokes. It's just a moon. A moon. But the witch of Endor. <laughs> Because what's before before you lose? <laughs> um, and he goes and pretends he's not the king. He's the, because, because to be a medium to be a witch was illegal. You know, it was against the principle of this, this pack of pain. Um, and he goes there and he says, please fill up for me Sam. And then he gets all Sam. And she does. Sam appears. And, and Saul says, God abandoned me, God direct me, what do I do? And Samuel said, about this. <laughs> and, uh, put yourself in God's hands. You know, accept your punishment and trust God. And Saul does it. See, the reason why God will answer him is because of that all the answers. Whatever is Saul's given, answer that Saul's given, Saul's going to reject. So even though he gets an answer from Samuel, the prophet rejects that. He goes to fight on Mount Gilboa, and there the Philistines have a great victory. And Saul is three sons of Jonathan are okay. At this point, when Saul is wounded, Saul in, in total despair falls upon his sword. David's response here in the death of Saul is not a relief. It's not, oh joy, I'm finally free. It's not not to be king. His response is grief. His response is mourning. His response is uh, the mighty of fall. And he invites the song to mourn, talking about the death of Saul as a tragedy and terrible thing. See, David loves that. Even though Saul is an enemy, David does not hate Saul. David forgives him, David wants his, soul, wants his good, and David mourns him. When Saul dies, he goes back to Hebron, and there becomes the king of the one section of Israel. And we'll end the life of David there for now and next week. Um, questions, comments, concerns? What does Mount Gilboa mean? What does the Gilboa mean? <laughs> I didn't look that one up, I'm sorry. Uh, I know, but you were, you were needling me about it all the time. But I, I had to end it with that. <laughs> Better. Yeah. All right, so let's go to bread. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy and goodness to us. If you always hear your voice and call us back to you, and we always respond in the way you wish. We always say and do be your glory. Glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And mighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.